Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start of my review of This Is Not A Drill, an Extinction Rebellion handbook. So, blurb time, it's time. This is our last chance to do anything about the global climate and ecological emergency. Now or never, we need to be radical, we need to rise up, and we need to rebel. This book contains everything you need to know about how to do it. By the time you finish it, you will have become an Extinction Rebellion activist. Act now before it's too late. So obviously Extinction Rebellion are kind of a climate change um, action group trying to encourage basically the entire world to do something before we all die. Um, I think the best way to explain who and what Extinction Rebellion is, is to read this, which is their Declaration of Rebellion, which I think this is a fucking masterclass in writing. We hold the following to be true. This is our darkest hour. Humanity finds itself embroiled in an event unprecedented in its history, one which, unless immediately addressed, will catapult us further into the destruction of all we hold dear. This nation, its peoples, our ecosystems and the future of generations to come. The science is clear. We are in the sixth mass extinction event and we will face catastrophe if we do not act swiftly and robustly. Biodiversity is being annihilated around the world. Our seas are poisoned, acidic and rising. Flooding and desertification will render vast tracts of land uninhabitable and lead to mass migration. Our air is so toxic the United Kingdom is breaking the law. It harms the unborn while causing tens of thousands to die. The breakdown of our climate has begun. There will be more wildfires, unpredictable superstorms, increasing famine and untold drought as food supplies and fresh water disappear. The ecological crises that are impacting upon this nation and on this planet and its wildlife can no longer be ignored, denied or go unanswered by any beings of sound rational mind, ethical conscience, moral concern or spiritual belief. In accordance with these values, the virtues of truth and the weight of scientific evidence, we declare our duty to act on behalf of the security and well-being of our children, our communities and the future of the planet itself. We, in alignment with our consciences and our reasoning, declare ourselves in rebellion against our government and the corrupted, inept institutions that threaten our future. The willful complicity displayed by our government has shattered meaningful democracy and cast aside the common interest in favour of short-term gain and private profit. When government and the law fail to provide any assurance of adequate protection of and security for its people's well-being and the nation's future, it becomes the right of citizens to seek redress in order to restore dutiful democracy and to secure the solutions needed to avert catastrophe and protect the future. It becomes not only our right but our sacred duty to rebel. We hereby declare the bonds of the social contract to be null and void. The government has rendered them invalid by its continuing failure to act appropriately. We call upon every principled and peaceful citizen to rise with us. We demand to be heard, to apply informed solutions to these ecological crises, and to create a national assembly by which to initiate those concerns needed to change our present cataclysmic course. We refuse to bequeath the dying planet to future generations by failing to act now. We act in peace, with ferocious love of these lands in our hearts. We act on behalf of life. So I thought this was an alarming statistic. Um, four environmental defenders a week are being killed in the global south. Four a week, that's, you know, one every couple days. I thought this uh, was an interesting idea. So this is from Mohammed Nasheed, president of the Maldives from 2008 to 2012. He says, let us not forget what we owe to decent working people such as coal miners. The tremendous wealth the world enjoys today, the technological progress, the huge increasing living standards is due to the work of these people. We should not blame coal miners or loggers or oil rig workers for causing the climate crisis. Instead, we should thank them for helping to fuel human civilization. Coal miners are not the problem. Coal is the problem and we confuse the two at our peril. When it comes to acting on climate change and shifting the global economy off fossil fuels, I propose a test. The working people who stand to lose most from the end of the fossil fuel age should be the first to gain from the new clean economy. And we should apply that test before each and every intervention we make. And we have an interesting thing, uh, this section here is called fighting the wrong war and it's talking about the drug war and why fighting the drug war is counterproductive when we should be fighting the global warming war, you know? He says, we'll begin with the police. Since 2010, British activist circles and society at large have been rocked by the so-called spy cop scandal. Undercover officers infiltrated environmental campaign groups, acted as agents provocateurs, formed intimate relationships with female activists, fathered children with them, and then abandoned their new families once their deployment was over. This was a systemic failure of policing ethics on a monstrous scale. We have uh, a mention of Sir Robert Peel, who was from Tamworth, and he also founded the British police force. So it says, um, filling the gaps left by failed policy, it is increasingly police and crime commissioners who are instituting opiate substitution therapies, pill testing and diversion schemes. 
The international organization Law Enforcement Action Partnership is spearheading the realization that the war on drugs is, in fact, a betrayal of the police's original moral purpose, summed up in Robert Peel's founding principle, the police of the community and the community of the police. And a couple of interesting bits here from a section called Survival of the Richest. I think, first of all, these are some interesting ethical questions that get asked. So instead of considering the practical ethics of impoverishing and exploiting the many in the name of the few, most academics, journalists and science fiction writers instead considered much more abstract and fanciful conundrums. Is it fair for a stock trader to use smart drugs? Should children get implants for foreign languages? Do we want autonomous vehicles to prioritise the lives of pedestrians over those of its passengers? Should the first Mars colonies be run as democracies? Does changing my DNA undermine my identity? Should robots have rights? And then I thought this was just a pretty damning indictment of the world we live in. But the more devastating impacts of pedal to the metal digital capitalism fall on the environment and the global poor. The manufacture of some of our computers and smartphones still uses networks of slave labour. These practices are so deeply entrenched that a company called Fairphone, founded from the ground up to make and market ethical phones, learned it was impossible. The company's founder now sadly refers to their products as fairer phones. So I thought this bit was interesting here uh, in the, the section, the climate emergency and the end of diversity. Yet there seems to be very little concern about climate change and the ecological crises we face. When I post about, say, a bed and breakfast owner who has turned away gay people, there will, understandably, be thousands of tweets about it. But post about the breakdown of the natural world and few engage with anything like the same passion. Unfortunately, many of us who are concerned with social justice and identity politics, including the wider left-wing movement, as well as, of course, the right, have made what is looking every day more like a fatal mistake. We have not given any thought to how the express train of ecological breakdown will smash through this delicate diversity we have spent so much time building brick by brick. We have forgotten that all of these important issues, in fact every issue, resides within the most important issue bar none, the planet. With a broken planet we will have no gay rights, no feminism, no respect for trans people, no attempt at fairness and justice for people of colour. What we will have is a fight to survive and a lot of violence. It's only recently that voices such as that of British broadcaster Sir David Attenborough have talked of the collapse of civilizations and societies, or what food insecurity will mean for us and for generations to come. In February 2019, Extinction Rebellion's Roger Hallam put it bluntly, war, mass mental breakdown, mass torture, mass rape. This was eye-opening as well. Um, sea level rise is a good indicator of the rate of change because it is affected by many factors. In 2007, satellite data showed a sea level rise of 3.3 millimeters per year. Yet that year, the IPCC offered 1.94 millimetres a year as the lowest mark of its estimate for sea level rise. Yes, you're right. That's lower than what was already happening. It's like standing up to your knees in flood water in your living room, listening to the forecaster on the radio saying she's not sure if the river will burst its banks. It turned out that when scientists could not agree on how much the melting polar ice sheets would be adding to sea level rise, they left out the data altogether. That's so poor, it's almost funny. This is cool too, because they talked about how... Um, Basically, when they shut down some, um, some bridges, um, here, well, here's what they wrote about it. The five central London bridges that Extinction Rebellion blocked in November 2018 were chosen as they are routinely shut down for the London Marathon. So the city has a pre-existing plan for its emergency services around these sites. So they've kind of been considerate in their, in their protesting, you know. And then there's a piece on feeding the rebellion, which is written by the food coordinator. Um, and... So one of the things which I'm delighted to see here is uh, Cook Vegan. Besides being good for the planet, it ensures maximum inclusivity and top health and safety standards. Plus, it's easier to source the ingredients. With fresh vegetables and a quick turnaround, there's nothing that will go bad, even without refrigeration. Try not to use any nuts. Keep it gluten-free. Be careful to flag up allergens, though sesame and soya can be difficult to avoid. And then it's got a simple dish that could be scaled up easily, and it's rice and lentils. And I mean, I'm vegan, but rice and lentils does not sound appealing to me. It's like the blandest food ever. There's a great quote here from Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller uh, designed the geodesic dome, uh, amongst other things. He was quite a remarkable man. And he said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Which is, I think, uh, very relevant in this day and age, you know. And uh, here in this section, a political view by Caroline Lucas, MP. She's the MP for the Green Party. And she's talking about proportional representation, which is something I believe in. I mean, I, I voted for the Green Party, so she's going to talk about it here. In the UK, our Parliament's upper chamber consists of 785 unelected members, and our winner-takes-all voting system means even our elected representatives don't reflect the views of the public. At the 2017 general election, 68% of votes didn't get translated into seats, denying millions of people a voice. In 2015, more than a million people voted for the Green Party, but I was the only Green MP elected. 
Under a proportional system, I'd have 24 green colleagues by my side, helping to expand environmental protections and transform our economy. Electoral reform could revolutionise our politics. It's time we modernised our electorate too. Young people around the world taking part in inspirational school strikes over climate change are right to demand that the voting age be lowered to 16. My generation's failure to tackle climate breakdown and ecological collapse is unforgivable. Young people will live longest with the consequences of decisions made now, so it's only right that they should have a say in shaping them. So yeah, overall I did think it was really fascinating, it was cool that it had all the different viewpoints of a lot of different experts, I mean the, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury, or the former Archbishop of Canterbury, I don't know if he still is, Rowan Williams, he did uh, the afterword in it. Um, yeah, I mean it's a bit dense at times and it's kind of unforgiving, it's not the most cheerful of books, makes you feel kind of bleak when you read it, and yeah, it is like actually surprisingly dense for such a small visual book you know it took me about three days to read this thing but I do feel better prepared to face climate change now and I also feel better prepared to be an advocate for things so for that I can't really fault it I only give it a 3.75 out of 5 um, it's not actually as good as I was expecting it to be and already feels a little bit outdated in places so maybe they need to do a new edition but definitely if you're concerned about the environment and the way things are going Check this, check this bad boy out. So there we have it, that's what I thought of This Is Not A Drill, an Extinction Rebellion handbook. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed it. Back to ran out. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Yeah, I uh, couldn't be bothered to set the microphone up for this, this last little bit.